So we're going to get started now. Uh, I'm Mike Winkler. I'm the uh, Managing Director for OLA, the Open Library Environment, and want to welcome everyone to today's Folio Forum, um, which is a primer on Folio code and will be presented by uh, Index Data. Uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, we are recording today's session. Uh, and you'll be able to get a link uh, to the recording if you had registered for this. If not, you can go to the openlibraryenvironment.org uh, uh, website and find the, uh, the recording there. Um, today's session is going to be uh, primarily focused on walking you through uh, the folio code and how to engage with it. There will be a short presentation uh, to provide context on the platform so that you can kind of understand all of the pieces. Uh, and then uh, a more practical component integration, how all the pieces come together into the UI uh, to provide functionality. We have three speakers today. Jakob Skosen is the architect and developer at Index Data. Jacob works on uh, advanced user interface and meta search technologies and holds a dual Master's of Science degrees in computer science and software engineering. Kurt Nordstrom is a software engineer at Index Data and he is currently working to develop the infrastructure for the Folio platform. He's been involved in library software development since 2003, a native Texan stranded in the DC metro area husband of one, father of several, and currently holds the record for the biggest hair at Index Data. And Peter Murray uh, returned to talk about open, uh, who is the open source community advocate at Index Data. He returns uh, to um, uh, contribute to today's uh, presentation. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Peter to get started. And uh, there will be a question and answer session at the end of this. So you can use the Q&A box to ask questions, uh, and we'll queue them up for our, our panelists. Thank you. Peter? Oh, silence. Uh, is this better now? Much, much better. Oh, okay. Well, it, it helps if I unmute myself. Okay. Uh, let me start again then. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us here in this uh, uh, presentation uh, th that's a primer on the folio code. Uh, this is an exciting time in the Folio project. Uh, earlier this month, uh, we opened up uh, the code repositories, uh, and uh, if uh, you had signed up on the Folio website uh, and indicated uh, your interest in helping to develop the software, uh, I believe you should have received an email earlier this month uh, pointing you to the uh, uh, dev site uh, that Jacob is going to talk about and the, uh, the pointers to the code itself. Uh, and we've received a lot of uh, gratifying comments uh, so far uh, about the, uh, the, the, the state of the code and the documentation. Uh, we're improving it all the time uh, and uh, encourage uh, your feedback. Uh, today uh, we wanted to point to uh, where that code and documentation lives uh, in case you hadn't been there already uh, and also walk through uh, uh, 
uh, some context of, of the platform uh, and also give you a, a, a bottom uh, bottom up view of how the pieces fit together. Uh, my part uh, is uh, to prevent or present, excuse me, present uh, a little bit about uh, the context, uh, a little bit of the story of where we are now. Uh, and uh, what to uh, expect to find in the future. Uh, I'm going to start uh, backwards a little bit uh, in uh, a presentation uh, that was given uh, by Philip uh, at, a, at a previous uh, Folio forum on the process for user interface design. Uh, and if you haven't seen that, uh, I'm going to uh, point you to that in a minute, but I, I wanted to, to call out uh, two slides uh, from his presentation. Uh, one is this slide, uh, which gets to the heart of how we're thinking about uh, the process of, of building folio. Uh, normally, um, a, as Philip says, uh, the user interface and the, the user experience uh, comes very late in the development process. Uh, typically, uh, a application development goes from uh, strategy and figuring out what it is that you want to do uh, into the software development, uh, and then finally, you know, a realization that we've got to uh, create a pretty user interface on it. Um, I know in, in some of the things that I've developed, uh, certainly that's, that's the approach that I've taken, uh, being a, 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 a developer at heart, uh, really getting in and developing the functionality uh, and then thinking about the user face on the interface on the end. Um, and what that means is the user interface ends up being uh, you know, what he refers to as decorations, uh, better colors, nicer fonts, uh, maybe a more interesting layout. Uh, but because it's come at the end, uh, there's not much to, to do with uh, affecting the design of the software. And that's not what we're doing here. We, we're actually moving uh, in, in a pipeline, as much as it's a pipeline from strategy to user experience and uh, user interface design uh, to development. But really, as the, as the back and forth arrows show, uh, strategy is informing user interface design, which is informing development. Development is informing user interface design, uh, which is informing strategy. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of fluidity uh, in, the, in, this, in this process of, of building up the folio code. Um, uh, Philip then goes on to uh, describe uh, the pieces that are involved uh, with this. Uh, if there are um, subject matter experts uh, that are on the call right now, uh, hopefully you've seen that your input um, and, and your discussions with Philip uh, are already working their way into the, uh, the uh, uh, prototype design of uh, the, uh, the user interface and, and the user experience. Uh, this is the, the second slide that I wanted to pull out of his presentation, uh, kind of a, a view of where we are right now. And, and uh, Philip certainly goes into more depth in this in his presentation. Uh, but know that from a, a coding perspective, as we talk about some of that back and forth uh, between the, the user experience design and uh, the functional coding, uh, we're kind of right here between design refinements and prototype coding. Uh, that's, that's the state of where we are in September 2016. And of course, this, this line is going to move progressively further to the right uh, as uh, development teams get going uh, and as the uh, user interface is, um, is refined. Uh, so I promised I would uh, point you in the direction of 
uh, the uh, the Phillips presentation. Uh, and so this is a, a website called uh, discuss.org, uh, discuss.folio.org, HTTPS, discuss.folio.org. Uh, and here there is, uh, very early on you'll see uh, a post by Philip, uh, the first demonstration of the user interface. Uh, and uh, it has a link to his uh, presentation, uh, a recording of his presentation. It's uh, 90 minutes long, uh, but I highly recommend uh, that you view that uh, to get a background on how the pieces of folio are fitting together. Uh, there is also a URL to his uh, prototype. Uh, so we'll wake up that tab. Uh, and start up the prototype. Uh, Philip talks about this for uh, most of an hour. I'm just going to give you the, the, uh, the, the, a little taste of what's here uh, and again I encourage you to go and watch Philip's presentation uh, about uh, where he talks in more detail about what's here. Uh, but the basic design for Folio is a, a full screen web app uh, onto which uh, the Folio applications uh, put their widgets and uh, their interactions with the user. Uh, this is a, a, an example of uh, looking at uh, the, the people database in the system. Uh, we've got a, a, a toolbar up here. Uh, which shows a, a little bit of a, of a breadcrumb of where you are and how you've gotten, to, gotten there. We have a section here that is the apps that have been added to the system. Uh, and then we have a, a system toolkit uh, section here. Uh, if there are apps that aren't here uh, that you need to add, you can open uh, the apps and uh, see what's here. Um, select them by name, and add them to your list of apps up here. Uh, some other things. Uh, one thing to note is um, there's a great deal of discussion right now about the, the concept of a, of a unified uh, uh, user database. Uh, most systems that we work with right now, particularly in integrated library systems, uh, separate the notion of staff users uh, from patron users. Uh, and that's how this is uh, represented here. This is, is some of our current thinking on this. Uh, there's a, a, a wide-ranging discussion uh, back on Discuss, this topic, uh, making a distinction between uh, patrons and system users. Uh, there's, there's been quite a thread of discussion here already. Uh, and if you have some thoughts on that, uh, come in to discuss uh, and see what's there and, and add your thoughts. Uh, what else is here? Uh, we have um, uh, notifications, uh, the, the concept uh, that there are notifications that can come from uh, any app. Uh, and we can filter them by uh, apps here and, and see what's here. Uh, notion of uh, file handling. Uh, this is something that, that is, Jacob goes, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Philip goes into some depth on in his presentation, uh, the awkwardness of how files are handled uh, in, a, in a web interface. And so, uh, there's a notion of a file handler here, uh, files that can be imported and then uh, run through an automation process. Uh, speaking of automation processes, um, uh, where's the automation? Here we go. Uh, there's some thought to uh, being able to, to do things in batch. Uh, and to use a if this then that like structure, uh, given a trigger and data having one or more actions that uh, can be applied uh, to that data based on that trigger. Uh, 
uh, a bookmarking uh, section. Uh, if there are records uh, that are, are bookmarked, and we should be able to get to one here uh, in the uh, prototypical cataloging module, uh, we want to bookmark this uh, and add it to a particular bookmark set, uh, remove bookmarks, or add some kind of reminder based on this. But when we build up a set of bookmarks, uh, there are things that, based on your permissions, uh, you would be able to do. Uh, run a batch update on them, export them, create a report. Uh, all of that is, is in the bookmark setting here. Uh, and then lastly, a, a kind of a system setting module. Uh, where you can uh, set uh, details about the, the uh, interface uh, and where the app-specific settings will work. So again, I encourage you to watch Jacob's presentation um, and, and play with this, this prototype uh, user interface and uh, start to uh, give some feedback uh, to us. Speaking of feedback, uh, the one final thing I wanted to point out is a uh, Folio Communication Spaces page on the wiki. Uh, it talks about the, the uh, notion of having uh, these four uh, primary communication tools, a uh, web and, and email forum called Discuss, uh, a wiki, uh, issues, and of course GitHub. Uh, you might recognize some of these logos. Obviously, this is the GitHub logo. Uh, we're using Atlassian products, uh, Jira and Confluence, uh, for uh, uh, the wiki and the issues, and a piece of software called uh, Discourse uh, for the web and email forum. Uh, there are, if you read down through here, uh, there's some suggested ways on how to get uh, how to uh, get involved with these tools. Uh, most of them are things that you can register yourself for, uh, and then uh, start participating in the community. Uh, speaking of these tools, I'm going to uh, pass the WebEx ball over to. Uh, Jacob, and he's going to uh, start uh, talking about uh, GitHub. Thank you, Peter. So I'll pass that ball to you in a moment. Uh, is my uh, am I audible? Can can yes. people hear me? Okay, yep. great. Loud and clear, and you have the presenter ball. All right. Uh, let me try to share. All right, so hopefully that worked. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, so I'll very quickly go through the um, uh, you know the different tools we use uh, to support building the the Folio project, uh, building the source codes, and and uh, you know sort of allowing us to move. From the prototype that uh, that Peter showed you, like gave you a, a good a good overview of, uh, to actual running code. So I'll start with the uh, with the devfolio.org, which is which is our sort of jump um, jump page for developers. Uh, we try to keep it updated with all with links to all uh, repos, with links to things like uh, guidelines for um, for collaboration, uh, for uh, for uh, committing code to our repos, and so forth. Um, so maybe maybe let me just very quickly go through it. So um, uh, currently, Folio, uh, as, you, uh, as you might have heard or received an email, we have went into an open development phase uh, end of August, where we have opened up uh, um, uh, most of the repos we have um, we have in the Folio project, um, different projects that that constitute the Folio platform. Um, we have not uh, we have not uh, treated that as an initial release of any sort. It's just pretty much letting people in to see how how things are being built, 
uh, kind of like a behind the scenes uh, access to the projects. Uh, people can already browse and if people, some, some developers feel, um, uh, uh, you know, advantages, they can try to collaborate. Uh, but again, uh, this is really uh, the very initial, um, initial uh, presentation of what the, what the guts for the project look like. So, um, a good starting point for uh, for trying to play with the code is Okapi, which is one of the one of the sub projects in, in Folio. Um, Okapi is the uh, is the um, and by the way, uh, I won't be going much into architecture and 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 and, and talking about how the different different components uh, talk to each other. Um, there is a uh, presentation we did. On uh, on uh, on Folio uh, Folio forum, I guess two months ago, which is recorded. I, I think uh, Peter can provide a link um, that I encourage you to, to to look if you if you need more information about the architecture and the, and the approach and what drives the architecture. And I'll I'll be just focusing on the on the components that build up the platform at this point. So going back to Okapi, um, Okapi uh, is the the sort of central uh, central piece for the for the platform is the is the implementation of the API gateway, uh, kind of like a middleware for a traditional system. Uh, that's the thing that, uh, that talks to modules, that uh, um, and controls access to the modules, so enforces authentication and authorization. Um, that's the, it has pieces to actually deploy modules on different, uh, uh, different platforms, different cloud platforms or, or local platforms. Uh, so it, it is a collection of like core services for, uh, for, uh, for the platform. Um, so you can get to the code, to the, the repo directly from the dev website. Um, uh, very short readme. It comes with a uh, with a guide and reference on how to how to how to how to build it, uh, and then how to interface with it. Uh, talks about core services that we have in Okapi uh, that can be used to um, uh, uh, to uh, enable modules, to run modules. Uh, I'll talk about the modules in a moment. Um, and gives you some uh, some overview of, of of the of the whole system, the the, the whole platform. Um, uh, the next uh, sort of big element of the platform is Rammel Module Builder. Uh, it may not be a, a great name at this point. We're still working on renaming some of our projects, but that's pretty much the piece that uh, um, that controls uh, creation of services, uh, and that's a piece that can be reused by module uh, module authors, module uh, module developers to uh, to create web services to create. Uh, uh, persistent web services that can talk to a database and that can, you know, expose uh, expose entities uh, 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 over HTTP and over over RESTful RESTful web services. Uh, it is a, a kind of a framework that people can uh, can bring into their own project. It's a Java tool uh, built with uh, with with Vertex in mind. Vertex is a, a Java. Uh, Java toolkit for building uh, for for building um, um, high performance um, uh, servers. Um, uh, it comes with a documentation on how to use it. Uh, talks about the workflow on on how to uh, how to how to include the project in your build pipeline. If you if you if you happen to use Java, it's a great way to start building building modules that provide persistency, for example, but not necessarily only persistency. Uh, it, uh, you know, you can uh, you can build uh, easily uh, build initial modules that simply expose any kind of service with this tool. Um, it's the tool we use, uh, we use ourselves to provide other modules, and those other modules are listed here. Uh, we have a sort of very early um, uh, prototype of the circulation module uh, built using the RAML module builder, which pretty much consists of a set of RAML files. Uh, RAML is a, um, a RESTful API modeling language, a JSON schema files that describe messages going back and forth. Um, and um, and those, those two kinds of, uh, of, of specifications are used eventually to drive the RAML module builder to generate uh, interfaces Java, uh, that Java developers can work with and implement functionality. Uh, so, you know, starting with some RAML files, uh, um, some JSON schemas, using the RAML module builder in your project, and then um, providing some 
some some business logic and 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 using some of the um, the data access points that we provide you can build uh, build new modules new functionality on the back end for the project uh, there are examples of other of other uh, other modules uh, acquisitions is another one uh, again this is all very sort of early prototype uh, versions um, uh, so you know take uh, take all the functionality provide with, with a grain of salt um, uh, we have some basic sort of non-library specific uh, modules, like configuration modules that can can be used by by other uh, other elements of the system, other modules on the on the platform to store uh, store any kind of configuration uh, key value per uh, uh, kind of configuration. Uh, we have an authentication module, which is a kind of a special thing on the platform. That's the that's the piece that uh, um, uh, that can work in conjunction with Vocapi with the core platform to provide. Um, pluggable authentication mechani mechanism, uh, so it can uh, eventually talk to uh, external identity stores uh, uh, to you know to authenticate coming users and then work um, uh, in orchestration with with a copy to to enforce authorization. So um, the platform comes with a uh, with a notion of permissions. Those permissions can be managed. Those permissions can be extended by uh, new modules uh, providing new definitions of permissions. Um, and the uh, authentication module with a copy uh, uh, work, uh, uh, you know, to ensure those, per those permissions are followed, uh, both by modules and by users, because we have a notion of both. Um, mod metadata, finally, is a, an attempt to um, come up with a unified solution for a, for a catalog and a uh, knowledge base, um, which I won't be going in, uh, into in much deal, but uh, but I, I encourage you to uh, to participate in the channels uh, Peter mentioned to discuss uh, different functionality. And finally, we have a separate repo for um, reusable uh, RAML uh, traits and um, and um, and uh, and collection types. If you have worked with RAML, you can you know that um, once you start defining uh, RESTful web services with RAML, there is a, a, a bunch of repetitive uh, 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 repetitive behavior that you have to um, you have to expose in your services things like authorization things like paging um, and so forth so we have captured some of those um, in form of reusable traits that you can uh, that you can include in your RAML definitions and you know make use of them that not only makes it easier for you to uh, to, to very quickly build web services but also makes it easier to uh, to make sure that the platform and the approach um, uh, two APIs on the platform is aligned uh, across different modules. Um, finally, uh, the client side uh, piece. So what I have described so far, that's mostly the backend backend pieces. So stuff focused on on on, uh, on persistency, on, on on managing data, managing main entities on the platform. Uh, finally, the client side uh, is the piece that we envision will 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 eventually allow us to uh, to build uh, the prototype as you have uh, as you have seen um, uh, it consists of a couple of different projects the core project is stripes which uh, which uh, is a collection of uh, of libraries that we um, uh, that we call with an umbrella term uh, umbrella term sorry um, UI toolkit, pretty much built on top of uh, very popular uh, browser uh, browser technologies, uh, React and Redux, um, uh, trying to both simplify data access into a copy on one end, so providing some uh, some nice abstraction for the developers to work with uh, data coming from those backend services that I, I, I talked about uh, before, uh, and on the other hand, providing a list um, a collection of components that can be can be reused. Uh, uh, when building uh, user interfaces for the applications, so uh, so there will be stuff uh, um, that can that 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 you could see uh, in the prototype that is used across different apps or the core apps that we ha that we currently have things like single item lists, multiple item lists, um, um, ways to plug into the, the the recent application toolbar, ways to present your application logo on the on the application uh, applications list, ways to uh, uh, to feed into the breadcrumbs uh, navigation and so forth, so that. That uh, the toolkit will have APIs for all of that, um, and additionally some reusable components that you can use in your application. Um, uh, finally, uh, elements that integrate the the, the user um, uh, user interface libraries with the with the backend. Uh, so uh, we need um, uh, if you have seen the architecture. Um, 
architecture uh, presentation, we envision the system as being multi-tenant ready from, from day one. So, uh, so it has a notion of tenant. So tenant will, tenants obviously will have different configuration, different selection of modules and, and applications uh, um, uh, in, their, uh, in their domain. So we need to be able to support uh, multiple installations and, and, and be able to select on the fly different modules and then regenerate the UI because as Peter mentioned, the UI is a single page application. So a pretty much a static collection of HTML and JavaScript files that is being downloaded to your browser, runs on your browser and then uh, and then manages the data by, by talking to the web services of, offered by the Folio platform. Uh, finally, um, just to sort of make this all uh, a little bit simpler for for people to uh, to digest and, and 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 you know when you open this up there's a bunch of projects uh, it's not very clear you know where uh, where one should start we have a folio, uh, folio sample modules uh, project uh, that project contains some very simple modules um, uh, like getting started modules um, uh, uh, built with different technologies mostly Java because that's what we use on the back end uh, right now it's limited. Uh, Limited to backend modules, so it shows you how to write your um, uh, write, write your own backend module. And by the way, Kurt is going to talk about that in a moment. Um, and all use and also uh, uh, shows how to use a more sort of exotic languages like Perl <laughs> uh, to to build one. Uh, we plan to expand uh, the scope of this. Also includes um, uh, user interface elements, so you can see how to how to use the toolkit uh, when the toolkit is ready uh, to uh, to build uh, build uh, build interfaces for the apps. Um, and generally, you know, be able to uh, to use this as a as a uh, as a tutorial for for building. Uh, for we're dealing with different kinds of uh, kinds of uh, applications on the platform, uh, so that's pretty much the, um, um, an overview of the of the source code that we have. Uh, I encourage you to to look through it and and, and explore the code. Um, we have. Um, Connected to the source code, we have uh, uh, we have uh, Jira as our issue tracking uh, system. Uh, we have decided uh, to stick with Jira because we have a lot of experience with Jira, and and uh, there are some tools that will allow you to manage uh, uh, better manage issues that that show up in, in, in different projects. And as you can see, we already have a collection of of projects, uh, and we only gonna have more. So uh, we didn't want to have stick with with uh, GitHub's issue tracking, which is like very project oriented. Uh, um, so, uh, not sure how much time I have for that, but uh, but uh, Folio has its own uh, Jira tracker. You can sign up for that. You can browse through the issues. Uh, there are some projects that uh, map directly to um, uh, to the projects you've seen on GitHub. So there is Okapi and there is Stripes. Uh, so the, the backend, uh, the major backend component and, and major frontend component. Um, um, and uh, and uh, we also have a project representing different uh, persistency services. Uh, those are split into multiple modules, so mode circulation, mode uh, uh, acquisitions, uh, and so forth. Uh, representing Jira as a single project, uh, where you know if you know that there are issues with that project, you can directly go to one of those projects, file your issue, uh, describe what the problem is, or maybe it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a enhancement request that you have, and so forth. If you if you if you're you know. Uh, um, uh, close to the code, you understand the project structure. You can go directly. Otherwise, we have a uh, we have a uh, catch-all project called Folio and Jira, where uh, you know uh, hard to categorize issues can be filed. Um, and with that, I don't know how much time do I have left, Kurt. Uh, is it uh, is it uh, is it time for you to start? Um, I can start if you're ready. Um, if you have a few more things to say, I think we can. You know, I think if you have, you know, about five minutes left or so. Um, All right. I, I, I think I, I think uh, I think I'm I'm done for now. If there's any questions, we can we can follow up on some some of those issues. So yeah, please go ahead and uh, thanks, guys. Oh, do I need to pass the presenter ball to you? Yeah, you can just send a little uh, little green ball. Okay, let me do that. All right, so um, what I'm going to do is um, we're going to take a look at what's uh, involved in building a, a backend module um, for Okapi. 
Um, you know, there is obviously a front end component to things, but that is probably worthy of its own um, show and tell. So uh, we're just going to stick to the back end for today and just take a look at um, what that involves. So what we're going to try to do is this. we're going to take we're going to start with a copy and we're going to deploy one of our existing modules. We're going to take a look at the circulation module, which is part of our um, our storage layer, and we're going to deploy that and then we're going to create a module that will consume that module and produce, you know, unique output based on the other module. So you'll be able to see creation of a module and you'll also be able to see um, something of module to module communications. So let me uh, go ahead and share a screen here. I'm just going to kind of walk you through um, my uh, terminal here. It's going to find a little button to share my screen. Here we go. All right, so can everybody see that? Um, I should have my uh, um, Kurt Walker as my little prompt here for the terminal. So um, let me just uh, kind of walk through where we're going here. So this is just um, a sample environment that I have set up here um, to, to uh, run some modules in. Uh, we're going to start with um, just a little bit better copy. A copy um, as, uh, you know, Yaku covered is our, is our gateway. Um, it is multi-tenant, um, so we'll have to define a tenant for it before we can start using it. Um, a tenant is essentially an abstraction for a given organization. Um, and Okapi runs uh, directly over HTTP, and that is the uh, communications layer by which the modules uh, communicate with it. It's also the same. You also use HTTP commands to uh, configure Okapi as well, so everything happens uh, through HTTP. Um, which means that the modules themselves don't have any particular um, requirements in terms of implementation. They just have to make sure that they're able to um, speak the same language that Okapi is. So um, a module in itself is just a web service that's going to follow a few conventions um, that it needs to talk to Okapi, and then it also needs to have some associated metadata that's going to tell Okapi um, how to start and stop this module, and also how it's going to send uh, requests to and from uh, the module. So these are called the module descriptor and the deployment descriptor, uh, respectively. Um, so when I look at, when I show you the deployment descriptor here, it's going to be pretty simple. Uh, in production, it would look um, a bit more complex, but the basic um, concepts are the same um, because, you know, here we're just working with a single instance of a copy on localhost and we're not running our code in containers and we're not, um, you know, worrying about uh, cloud deployment and um, all the other fun stuff. But the same concepts do apply and they do scale. So we have that, is, a copy is built uh, with, that, with that in mind. So just the, because this uh, example is so simple um, doesn't mean that it's not going to scale up in the future. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the um, the, meta, the um, module descriptor for the circulation module and uh, talk a little bit about that. So, all right, so um, just briefly about the circulation module, what it is is it's a storage module um, that provides um, different services that are, that, are, that are related to circulation and the one that we're going to be focused on is that it provides us a a patron store, so it can it can it can uh, store and, and retrieve and, and query patron objects, which is pretty important for a given library system. Um, so, in this case, um, what we're doing is when we define the module descriptor for what a uh, copy needs to know about the module, it needs to have an ID, which um, you know this is what it uses to reference that module. Uh, it gives the module a name, which is kind of like a human readable name. Uh, it has this um, this provides um, section here, which um, is what we use to manage dependencies between modules. Other modules and their descriptors can look for these provides things and say they need to have a certain number of other modules present in order to be in the system. And then um, we have these routing entries, and what those are is those are telling Okapi, um, you know, when you have an incoming request coming into um, the gateway. What um, what paths and what methods 
should it match and where should it and, and you know when it gets those should it send them to this module and how should it should it handle them so um, we can see here we have uh, different ones for get post put and um, delete the path is the same for all of them the level is the priority at which it comes in in the event that we have uh, multiple modules matching the same path a copy needs to know which one to send the request to first um, and then we have the type. Um, in this case, it's request response, meaning it expects to read some data and also expects to return some data. Um, there are other requests. There are other types, such as uh, you know, just uh, like request only, meaning you know, it reads it doesn't doesn't return anything. Or we have um, another one that's just headers only, meaning the module is only interested in looking at and possibly modifying the headers of the request, but it's not actually going to modify the data of the request. Um, I could have just collapsed all these into a single entry, but um, I would normally like to break it out this way because it allows me to put permissions uh, for each um, routing entry. I'm not actually going to go into permissions um, right now, but just know that we are able to manage the um, required permissions on a per um, entry basis so that we can uh, get more granular as, as required um, for, for, for a real life system where we're going to have various permissions required to access various modules. Um, so, but we can see, so basically we have get, post, put, and delete. So we are defining these methods to allow us to use a circulation module to, to do basic CRUD on, on a, uh, a patient record. Okay, so um, that's, the, that's the module descriptor for the, for the circulation module. And the deployment descriptor um, is what a copy uses to, um, um, but how to start that module. So the deployment descriptor is a lot, lot briefer. Uh, you have the service ID, which corresponds to the, to the ID in the module descriptor. Um, the node ID tells you which, um, you know, copy node it's, it's running on. In this case, we're only running a single node of a copy on localhost that makes it simpler. And then the descriptor itself has information for um, what Okapi is going to use to actually start this module. Um, in this case, we see that the circulation module is a jar, Java jar. So um, you know, it's just a simple Java jar command to uh, start this module here, the circulation fat.jar um, file. And then we have, um, you know, whatever command line options the, the module expects. And this, um, this um, print, uh, this percent p um, placeholder in the, in the string is actually going to be replaced by a copy with the port number it's going to assign to the module when it starts it up. So when it starts the module, it's going to assign it a port and it's going to replace that um, uh, you know, percent p with what the actual port is, and that way you can the module knows what port to run on and a copy knows what port to talk to the module on. So um, that's an, an important uh, thing to remember for uh, deployment there. Um, and then we said that because um, because Okapi is multi-tenant, before we can even um, deploy any modules to it, we're going to have to define a tenant uh, to to be used uh, with the system. So a, a tenant script goes something like this. Okay, so. Um, this is our, um, our our testing tenant, the DIKU, which is the Danish Library Technology Institute. It's just kind of my go-to test tenant. And you have to give an ID, you have your, a readable name, and then you just have the description. And that's really all that's required um, to define a tenant. So um, let's just kind of look at how um, we use um, these, these, these descriptors that I've shown you thus far you know, how do we sit, tell a copy to take these and to deploy our circulation module? So we would do that um, just by sending these descriptors to a running instance of a copy um, over HTTP. So I have kind of a collection of um, um, curl commands here that will actually run in a bit. Um, so um, we would, you know, we would start a copy here. And then we, the first thing we want to do is create our tenant here. So um, all we're essentially doing is we're saying we're going to send the contents of that tenant descriptor there. We're going to send it to uh, the 
um, localhost 9130, which is where our copy is running, um, underscore slash proxy slash tenants. And the, the underscore URLs are Okapi's administration URLs. So when we are configuring modules or configuring Okapi, we are sending our um, requests to these underscore slash URLs. So, um, so slash, oh sorry, underscore proxy tenants is where we send, we post that tenant to saying create this new tenant. And then we're going to um, register the circulation module. We're going to send that module descriptor for the circulation module to Okapi. Um, so in this case, we're using that circulation.json under the module descriptors, and we're sending it to uh, underscore proxy modules, saying, "This is the new module I want you to know about," and that's got all the description, all the information about uh, the routing paths for that module. So, so you so you send that, and so a copy now knows about the module, but now you need to tell a copy how to actually deploy that module. That's when we send the deployment descriptor. So we'll send that to underscore discovery uh, modules, which um, takes that deployment descriptor, and once it gets that, it's actually going to start the module, and then it's going to associate it with the module descriptor that's already there. And at that point, the module is actually running, but we can't talk to it yet because we need to say, okay, this module is there. Now I need you to associate this module with our tenant that we have defined before. So um, we're just going to send it this... Um, this tenant association descriptor, which I, I didn't show you, but it's basically just saying uh, this module name for that tenant. And we're going to uh, post it to underscore proxy tenants DIKU slash module saying basically the module's up and running. Uh, please know now that I want this module to now be available on that tenant. So so that so that that's what that is so far. So once you do that, you will have the circulation module running um, and it will be accessible through the Okapi gateway. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that and, and demonstrate in just a second, but first I wanted to talk about, um, let's look at creating a module that would actually use that circulation module. So um, the, the circulation module is gonna have a number of patrons um, contained within it. So we have some sample patrons here. Let's take a look at uh, one of them here. All right, so a patron in this case is just a, a JSON blob, but it has various fields. And again, this is very preliminary. Um, in a real life system, we're certain that our patrons are probably gonna look very different, but uh, we need to start somewhere. So these are our sample patrons. And as, as we get a better idea of, of what we're gonna need, uh, this will obviously evolve a lot, but these are the fields that we define right now for a patron. So we have the patron's a status. The patron has a, a name, which is kind of like their, you know, human readable, which you'd expect, um, you know, a, a person name to be. And then we have the patron local ID, which is uh, what does the system refer to this name as? And then we have some content information, which uh, I really didn't feel like f filling in. So all the patrons live in the same location, I guess, and work at the same place. Uh, and then they have an email address and, and a phone number and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, but that, that, that's, that's what a patron looks like. But um, let's assume that we, need to, we want to build a, a, a convenience module. Um, so we want to build a module that's going to quickly give us access to just a few fields on the patron and not worry about the stuff that we don't need. So what we'd like to do is we want to really be able to access a patron by the patron's local ID and then, reach, and then get the patron's name and barcode and status uh, based on that. So what we're gonna do is we are going to build a, a very small web service that um, will just take a, 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 a patron's local ID and if that patron exists, uh, it's going to query the circulation module and say, please give me this patron matching this local ID. And it's going to pluck some fields from the returned um, uh, JSON, and then it's going to return it back to uh, the, 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 um, you know, the requester uh, saying, okay, here are the, here are the, the fields based on the, the, pat the patron's local ID that, 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 you, that you gave us. Um, so let's um, take a look at defining a module that will let, let us do this. Um, so what I've done is we have a, a module that I've, I've gone ahead and just built in Node.js just because of its brevity, and hopefully it'll be uh, clear uh, to walk through. Again, this could be built in anything, uh, you know, Perl, Python, uh, Java. You know, it's really up to whatever uh, development staff you're happy with. 
but uh, in this case, uh, um, just for the sake of screen space, uh, I, I just uh, worked up a short little module in Node so that I can just show that easily. So let's take a look at this. Um, so we've got this um, this query, uh, patron query name, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, module here. And let's take a look at what we have. So um, we have to import a few libraries in, in Node to make this work. Uh, we're using the Express Web Framework, which is a pretty common Node framework. Uh, this is not really important to know, and just kind of going through it. Um, we need to make sure that this module is able to take a command line um, argument in order to run on whatever port that uh, copy tells it to run on. So it will default to 3000, but you actually provide a, a port argument. Uh, you know, and in this case, it's um, designated by the P argument. Then it will it will use uh, that number to run the port on. Uh, it's going to go ahead and initialize the Express framework. It's going to say it needs to use this JSON body parser, meaning that it needs to be able to read and write actual JSON content. Uh, and then it sets up a router, which is what Express uses to actually route the routes to it. Um, it has a little function here that tells the router how to, how to um, parse the incoming uh, requests. And then it's going to assign a path um, to actually to actually route to. So in this case, you want to listen to, on the uh, p query, which you know, short for patron query slash patrons. And then we have this colon name, and that's going to be replaced by the actual um, name we're searching for. So in this case, it's going to be the uh, the, the local ID. So if the local ID is John Smith, um, we're going to put in query slash patrons slash John Smith. And it's going to, when it, when it gets that uh, incoming request, it's going to send it to a function called query patron. Um, then we just have some more bootstrapping with the apps, you know, and uh, telling it to listen on the port. And then we have the actual function that's going to um, actually handle the request. So it's going to pluck out that name uh, from the parameters that, that it got in. So it actually it automatically parses the parameters to give you the name. And then uh, it's going to set the the type for the uh, response to application JSON. And then um, it's got this function here called get okapi URL, which is what it uses to find out just like where exactly okapi lives because the the Web service knows that the re that any requests are going to come through a copy, but you know since it doesn't know exactly where a copy is running, it has to have a way of um, of, of being able to know where to send those requests to. So um, we have a function called get a copy URL, and I'll just jump down there really quick. And all that does is it's going to take the request object and look for a um, 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 header uh, called exocopy URL. And that is provided by Okapi to let um, modules know where to actually um, find the Okapi server. Uh, in the same way, we have a get tenant uh, function here that we'll be using, which also gets that exocopy tenant um, header, which is how a request uh, specifies and also uh, knows which uh, tenant it happens to be working with at any given time. So um, we'll just go back up to the function here. All right, so uh, um, it gets the Okapi uh, URL, which it needs for later. If it doesn't have one, it's going to throw an error saying, I, I don't even know where to find Okapi. I can't help you. Um, then it's going to build this uh, URL, which it's going to use to actually make the request. So. Um, this API slash patrons, that's the that's the um, the path for talking to the circulation module, which we saw when we de um, defined it in our uh, module descriptor for the circulation module. And then this query string is how we would um, tell the circulation module that we are interested in a patron that has a patron local ID that matches the patron name that we specified in the URL for our new module. Uh, and then we just have some, uh, you know, some feedback, just to, some uh, output, just to make sure that everything's working. Uh, and then we're going to build the request to actually to actually make that call, um, and that's done with this fetch um, thing here. So it's going to be a git 
Uh, it's going to be we're going to attach the this dummy authorization, and then we're going to attach this uh, the tenant specifier to it, and then um, uh, the uh, we don't actually have to post any information because all the query information is in the the get string, and then we're going to uh, basically just uh, send that send that request, and if it's okay, then we're going to read the JSON from it. And if we have no patrons in the returned um, uh, query, then we know that we didn't get any matches for our, for our, uh, for our local ID, so we can return a 404. Um, if we have more than one, then we know that something is wrong because there should only be one patron matching a given local ID, but it's going to return a 400 and give you an error saying there's multiple results for the specifier you gave me. And uh, assuming you get a 200 and uh, or everything's okay, then you're gonna you're gonna set the status to 200, and we're going to uh, pluck out a few fields from that JSON record. We're gonna give it the ID. We're gonna give you the name, the status, the barcode, and the email. Say so, okay, so uh, we were able to find a patron based on this local ID you gave us. Here are um, just some fields for it, and then it's gonna return that as a simple uh, JSON response. Um, so yeah, so so that's all. It's a very very simple. Um, module, um, but it will serve uh, its purpose. So, so that's the module, and just uh, this reminder: it's going to be the module listens on pQuery slash patrons, and then it uh, has a name following that. So that's the routing path that this module is going to listen to. So, uh, in light of that, we have to define a module descriptor for this module that's going to correspond with what the module uh, listens to, we need to tell a copy, okay, um, when you have a request come in on this um, path, please send it to this module. So uh, we're going to go back to our module descriptors and we're going to look at the name query descriptor here. And this one here, we only have one routing entry, so it's a lot shorter, but uh, we have our ID for it, we have a name, we have, tell it what it provides. And then we have uh, we only have one method, which is git. We're not we're not worried about um, you know creating or modifying or deleting anything here. We're just we're just querying. Uh, the path that it that it listens to is anything that comes in on pQuery slash patrons is going to get sent to this module. Uh, level is just 30, which is our default, saying you know this isn't getting special priority handling. And again, it's a request response module because it it does read information in and it does write information back. So that, that's the module descriptor there. And then, of course, the deployment descriptor here. So the deployment descriptor um, looks like this. So that's our, uh, our you know, service ID, which is matching the module ID. Uh, the node ID, in this case, is localhost, because we're only running on copy locally. And the descriptor tells it how to actually start the module. So uh, in this case, it's using the node um, executable. Which is uh, you know to run that node script, and then it has the path to where the actual script is, and we have the dash p uh, flag, which is saying set the port, and then we have our little placeholder again, the um, percent p, which says to a copy you know replace this with whatever port you actually want the uh, thing to run on. So we've got this um, set up um, to where we want it. So. What we're going to do is um, we're going to run through an actual example. So what we'll do is we will start a copy. We will send it the module descriptor for the circulation module. Or sorry, we'll send it the descriptor for the tenant. We'll send it the module descriptor for the circulation module, the deployment descriptor for, for the circulation module. Then we're going to make some requests to actually send, populate the circulation module with a few patrons, and then we will deploy the, um, we'll send the module and, and deployment descriptor for the, for the new module, that, and then we will make some requests against the new module, which will hopefully uh, query the circulation module and return us some, some response back from that. So um, let's take a look at our running script again, and just uh, step through the steps real quick. So. Here we see we're going to start a copy. Okay, we're going to create our tenant. We are going to register. We're going to send the uh, module descriptor for the circulation module, which uh, registers it. 
We're going to send the deployment descriptor for the circulation uh, module. We're going to uh, associate that circulation module with the tenant that we have. Um, we have a little script here just to go through our, our directory full of patron uh, JSON to send some patrons to the circulation module to populate it. Uh, then we're going to send the module descriptor for the um, for our new module, the name query module. Uh, we're going to send the deployment descriptor for that name query module. And then we're going to associate the name query module with the tenant. And so once that's all done, we'll have the we'll have a copy running and we'll have two modules associated with it. And then we're going to see if we can make some requests through a copy uh, to those modules. So. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and just, uh, we're going to run this and it's going to start up a copy and then send off the command. So you'll see a lot of output coming from a copy, which is basically saying, uh, giving you the okay that, that it has received these um, descriptors as it should and that everything looks good. And um, assuming that all goes well, then we'll make some, some requests against um, the, those uh, descriptors. So we're going to run the actual, um, commands here, which is going to send, it's going to call curl to send these um, JSON descriptors to Okapi. So we've got Okapi starting, which has to, then we send, uh, we're deploying the circulation module, it has to start up. Um, so we added a bunch of stuff and it went a lot faster than I can talk. So basically it deployed the circulation module, then it, it added the, see I'm going to scroll up a little bit. So. Um, you can see, okay, so <clears throat> let's just kind of go through one by one here. All right, so um, it started a copy. Um, then what it did was we sent our tenant descriptor to it. We sent our uh, module descriptor to the, to, for the circulation module. Then we sent the uh, deployment um, descriptor for the circulation module. Then what we did was we sent the um, the, the tenant association descriptor for the circulation module, basically saying we wanted to associate with our DAKU tenant. And then uh, we went ahead and we sent uh, some patrons um, to the to the circulation module. So we have a number of patrons that we sent, and I think there's about four of them, but you just see what it, what it, what it got sent. And then we have, um, then we've gone ahead and we've, um, sent the descriptor for the name query module, and then we sent the deployment for the name query module, and then finally we said associate the name query module with our tenant. So currently we have a copy running, we have the two tenants um, associated. So first, um, I'll just show you a, um, a query just against, we'll just send a, a raw query to the circulation module and see what kind of results you get. So this is basically just saying, uh, show me what patrons you have in the circulation module. So. So we have a little, well, I'll just, so this is our, this is, this would be how we would send a query to the um, circulation module. So you can see that um, it's going to send, it's going to send it to localhost 9130 slash API slash patrons. So, um, it's, so 9130 is where Okapi is running and we are providing the path that it knows to recognize the circulation. So everything is going through a copy at this point. We're not going to try to talk to anything directly. So I'll just run that. And you see we get a whole bunch of these verbose patron records um, here. So, um, so that's well and good. That means that the, that the records are there and that we're talking through a copy. So now we're going to call our our name query module, which is the one that we just uh, mocked up in, in Node really quick, and we're going to query a module based on its, uh, or sorry, query a patron based on its uh, local ID. So um, just to show you what that request looks like, um, we just take a look at our query name here, and uh, we're gonna we have a we're gonna try to find the um, the patron whose local ID is John Smith. And we're going to send that to localhost 9130. Again, that's Okapi's um, address slash pquery slash patrons. This is the path that goes to our name query module. And then slash John Smith is going to be the local ID that we're going to try to, uh, to query. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, run the query here. And um, 
there we have our, our output below is uh, some, you know, unimpressively formatted JSON, but we, we did get a successful result here. So the ID is John Smith, the actual name is Smith, John, the status is active, the barcode is, you know, a number, and, you know, it's got an email. So um, in this we've seen that this call that we made to our um, sample module here has in turn made a call to, um, to the uh, circulation module. And, um, you know, this is just an example of how um, simple back-end module-to-module call um, would work. So um, very soon um, I'd like to have, you know, a repo available where you can just uh, grab this stuff and just run it locally um, so, so, so you can see it and just have your little, you know, your own copy uh, running there. But I just wanted to just kind of demonstrate, um, even though, uh, See, there's a lot of steps. It's actually quite simple here to have two actual modules that are running, and um, just an idea of what the infrastructure for a backend module looks like. So, um, so with that, I'm going to um, pass the ball back to our presenter, and I believe we'll be able to take some questions. Uh, well, thanks, guys. Uh, this has uh, been um, a great walkthrough of the uh, Folio platform. Clearly, a lot of uh, progress is being made, um, and I'm, I'm sure that people have questions. So if you do have questions, uh, please use the Q&A box uh, in the WebEx client. Uh, we have a couple of questions already queued up, uh, and I'm going to start with one that's just um, a, just a clarify kind of thing. Uh, Kurt, in the in, in your walkthrough, we had a couple of questions regarding the, the JSON um, data set that you you showed that had patrons in it. Um, plus there was a significant amount of other kind of configuration information and persistent data that probably will um, be in a folio instance. The intent would be that this would be living in a database um, is the question. Uh, so I thought maybe you could comment on that, just to clarify. Yeah, so in a, in a, in a production system, these will n not be existing as, you know, JSON files on a, in, a, in a directory somewhere that gets sent with curl. You know, th these would be managed by a robust uh, configuration system, you know, that also would have persistence, you know, across reboots and that kind of thing. Um, so um, I was just using the actual files uh, just to show you the nuts and bolts of it, but there would definitely be more infrastructure around that uh, in production. Great. Uh, we also had a, another question. Um, a couple of people have asked this about, is there an IDE recommendation uh, to facilitate working with uh, Folio and debugging? Um, and and what, are, what are you and uh, Jakob using? Um, Jakob, do you want to comment on that? Maybe uh, a little bit about the uh, kind of the, the the Folio Common platform, or I guess the I know we I know we have a a a, um, a project that's that's meant to provide kind of at least for Java a kind of a bootstrap for for building modules. But um, I think Jakob might have some ideas on 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 tools. Uh, can you guys hear me? Am I? Uh... Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Uh, we don't really have any any recommended ID, but uh, but we actually use three different ones back back index data. So it's really pretty much you know up to uh, up to developers' preferences, I think. But we we use NetBeans primary, pr primarily uh, here in Copenhagen, uh, but we also have some guys using Eclipse. Um, some of some of them doing that on Windows, some of them doing that on Linux, um, and for the for, for the scripting languages, uh, Sublime. Some people use Sublime, some people use them, uh, Emacs. Uh, so you know a whole spectrum of things. So uh, it's one of those things that you know that we really try not to force people into into using any given IDE. So like for the Java stuff, everything is the the, the builds are controlled using Maven. So they just work with any ID, and the, generally the project is, is controlled using Maven. Um, for um, 
uh, for JavaScript, uh, for, so for Node stuff, uh, we, we we just use npm and packages.json and stuff like that. So so that that also works across different editors. Uh, so I mean, you know, if somebody wants to have uh, you know, like you know some sort of help from us, I, I would recommend NetBeans, I guess, for Java because that's what we're mostly familiar with. But other than that, I mean, you know, anything is is okay. Great. Um, we have another question that uh, is specific to, to uh, the demonstration today, but uh, in a loosely coupled system as Folio will be when, as you head towards full deployment uh, of, a, of a working system, uh, this is relevant. So the question is, uh, what would happen in Kurt's example if the CERC module was down and couldn't respond uh, to a query? So there's a couple couple elements to that. I mean, if we were if if it was down, I mean, and 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 the platform couldn't couldn't handle it. Uh, let me just get back to that in a moment. But uh, but let's assume it's like totally down. I mean, that you 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 are going to get you know uh, a, a never code back uh, that you would have to handle yourself. But that's but what's not been really talked about here is that you know we want to provide some. Um, some load balancing behind the scenes. We want to uh, provide failover cap capabilities behind the scenes. So Okapi will already uh, hook into a discovery system, um, and you know that the part of what hasn't been shown here is that uh, for any given module, uh, we will be running multiple instances of it. So 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 hopefully we can uh, we can provide failover in, in case of failures, um, and Okapi will. Will do its best um, to to give you a healthy instance to talk to, uh, you know. But there might be issues, you know, during the request when you're actually talking to a particular module uh, module instance, and then uh, then there, there there might be errors. You will need to deal with them. Uh, and for some, you might be able to repeat the request. There's going to be a error code that tells you that. And for others, uh, um, uh, for others, you know, you may not be able to repeat. Maybe something is, is just wrong with the way you're you're asking a question uh, from a module. So I'm not sure whether that's, that that completely covers it, but uh, but I <laughs> I hope that's good enough for now. I mean, we can you know we can we can elaborate on that on on, on different channels. Uh, right. So again, just to remind everybody uh, the the discuss uh, site is probably a good place to go in more depth on these kinds of issues, uh, and there's also Slack channels where you might be able to have a direct conversation. Um, another question has come in, uh, and this is, this is an exciting one because somebody is actually volunteering. Uh, has any work been done on Perl modules to communicate with Folio modules? Uh, and if not, this person would be interested in working on that. There hasn't been any specifically any work done besides the you know the sample Perl module I showed you that we actually did for fun. Uh, we had some Perl guys back. Uh, at our team, um, so so naturally they they and they wanted to try try out uh, uh, Perl, um, and really the the, the 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 you know the, the system is designed so that as long as you have uh, a programming language with fairly modern stack, uh, you have access to HTTP libraries, you have access to JSON parser. Um, uh, stuff like that, you can communicate with the system. If you want to build services and make sure that those services are aligned with our recommendations, then you probably need a tool that also understands RAML. But that's not a that's not a hard requirement. You can, you know, depending on how complex the module is, you could you could get by without having that. But but the the the, the real sort of uh, requirement is that you have an HTTP uh, both client and a server in your module and 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 an adjacent parser at this point. So you know you can just go ahead and and, and start coding them in Perl uh, without without having any libraries. That's that's really one of the design goals for the for the project that we. Uh, we do not uh, force you to link with any, any any libraries we provide when you code modules. It's a slightly different story for the user interface where we need to ensure, um, you know, come and look at feel, and, and we also want to have, uh, want to grant access to reusable components. Uh, then it's going to be slightly different. But but also the um, uh, that environment is much more constrained. So that, uh, as we mentioned, the UI will live in the browser, um, and you know, and um, and you simply need to write that in JavaScript and HTML. So, but for the backend stuff, you know, uh, as long as you can talk HTTP and and, and, and JSON, uh, you know, uh, you can choose whatever. Right. Uh, well, let me follow on uh, with that. Um, 
I'm sorry, Kurt, were you going to say something? Uh, this Peter. is Peter. I, I was yeah. going to add, you know, we're at a, a perfect point in the project for uh, people to, if they uh, kind of in the, the open source way have an itch that they need to, to scratch with Folio, uh, we can help uh, do things like uh, create a, a special interest group around uh, using Folio in a, in a particular programming language or uh, any number of things uh, to uh, actively support that development. Sure, sure. And I'm actually seeing some 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 discussion here on the back channel about this. I mean, you know, uh, the languages we use in-house, Java and JavaScript, they will probably get most love from us in terms of you know providing libraries where, which kind of alleviate you from having to write boilerplate code and so forth. Uh, if there's a community interest in doing the same, let's say, for Perl, I mean, that will be great. So, so you know, exactly what Peter is saying, I mean, we can establish a working group for that and, and people can, uh, uh, you know, because the, the, the entry uh, level is very low, there is low bar for, for the modules, but obviously, you know, even for the, for the simple notes, uh, module that you guys seen from uh, from Kurt. I mean, there is actually a, a, a bit of boilerplate that needs to happen. So, so there will be a way to simplify that. And I think to just build on that, we actually have several uh, questions coming in that are variations on this that really just get at. So, how, how would I get started um, with this? It, it, you know, it seems easy, but how do I know what all of those pieces look like? Uh, what, sh what should I be looking at in order to uh, get engaged with Folio, um, and, and where would be the right places to go uh, to look at, at things like that? Well, so I think there's sort of two levels, like in my mind, two levels of engagement. I mean, if you want to engage with the core code, so, you know, Okapi itself and, and the core services, uh, the UI toolkit, and some of the core modules, that the, what we call the system modules, so the stuff that provide, provides persistency. Um, you know, there are links to different uh, different repos on the dev website, what I've, uh, what I've shown you uh, during my, my talk. Uh, so that will be the place to start, and then simply browse the code and, and, and you know, check it out, try to compile it uh, and, and experiment with it. That will be the way to, to um, uh, to engage with the core uh, development, but we also envision, you know, people just want, wanting to write modules and not necessarily, um, you know, wanting to spend time on the on the on the core core pieces, uh, which is mostly infrastructure and, and and some of the reusable elements in the toolkit. Uh, and and for that, you know, for that we uh, we envision um, it's not t totally complete yet, but envision distributing different artifacts, different libraries over uh, both Maven and and npm, so that people don't really have to bother going again and compiling that stuff uh, and you know there will be guides on, on how to do it for the sample module repo is, is, is the beginning of, 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 of this sort of uh, effort um, and 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 yeah so 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 on that level if, if you if you're just interested in, in writing uh, modules uh, that don't necessarily need to need to do any persistence on their own um, you know uh, the guides and and the libraries distributed by a uh, Maven and NPMs would be the, the, place, the place to start. And in a system like this where there may be uh, many modules that get developed um, or pieces of functionality that could be useful uh, to people and that are being developed in a very distributed way as you've described, um, a question has come in about down the road, do you envision that Folio would host some sort of an index of those modules with some descriptions? Uh, other communities that have this kind of plug, uh, pluggable architecture uh, often have those kinds of catalogs and things. Uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly something that we uh, we uh, we we will, will have in the project. I mean, I don't have any any concrete details about this yet. I mean, you know, and you know, how is how is that going to look like? But yeah, it's certainly something that we're discussing. Whether that should happen through GitHub, uh, simply have a, a list of you know of a, re a master repo and things can can get linked, or some other way. I mean, you know, there there's sort of plenty of ideas around that. But but sure, I mean, the idea is that you know uh, that you build on, on other people people work, and when you can reuse uh, existing modules, you do that. So 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 eventually, you know, that you know, we want to create an ecosystem just like any. Uh, any other um, uh, project has, like you know, there there is an ecosystem around NPM modules, uh, around Maven, Java libraries, and so forth. We want to have the same for Folio. 
Um, another question about uh, sort of the startup mode for a developer who's interested. Uh, you've, you've talked about that there, it's a pretty low bar. Uh, you, you need to know a language that has certain components to it. But a question has come in about what kind of technologies, Java, JavaScript, Maven, Vertex, et cetera, would a developer need to grasp before they can head into coding something, let's say, substantial? Yeah, so those technologies, Java, JavaScript, Maven, Vertex, and et cetera, I mentioned uh, mostly in the context of the core development. Um, uh, so again, if you want to engage with the core development, and that's really, uh, for the time being, the only place where you can actively engage, because the system isn't 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 fully fleshed out yet in terms of uh, APIs. So so just writing modules is not really possible. Um, then yeah, those are the technologies you would have to master, and a bunch of others that are used. You can see that in the source code. Um, 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 for uh, for for the modules, I mean, you know, using those technologies it will probably be easier because we'll have we'll have guides and and, and examples code examples uh, uh, using Java JavaScript and, and and so forth. So so it's probably easier you know uh, easier for people if if you're right now trying to decide which language to use. I would say you know either go for Java with Vertex or JavaScript with Node uh, to write a module. Uh, but again, you know, if if you have you have other needs, uh, it's 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 possible to use another uh, technology stack. Great, and that, that fires off another uh, question about um, what you, part of your answer there was that not everything is complete. Uh, that there's a lot of work still going on with these uh, core modules. Could you say something about timeline for completing or reaching a plateau with these base modules? Uh, so that people would have some sense of when you've got a release that they could begin working around uh, with some stability. I believe we do not have an extensive timeline at this point. It's actually being being uh, being worked on. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Peter can 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 fill in more details on that. Uh, we are switching uh, uh, some of our efforts uh, uh, into building apps uh, starting from October. Uh, so, so we need to have the platform ready, um, well, at least ready, um, uh, uh, you know, to the point where it's possible to start building a simple user interface apps, and that's that's our that's our goal at this point. So, you know, we'll start dog footing in October, uh, especially the, the for the UI pieces, and and you know, in parallel, develop the platform, uh, um, uh, you know, by by you know by seeing what requirements. Uh, we have when we when we actually build applications. So I, I'd say you know the idea is that you know within the next couple of months we have we have some initial uh, um, readiness in the platform for for app, app developers to come in and, and start building apps. But you know with that understanding that that, that, that there is there is going to be a, a lot of open uh, um, um, uh, places for, for discussion where we need to nail down APIs when we need to. Uh, uh, provide some implementation, so so it, it's still going to be a uh, dialogue with us about you know filling in gaps. Uh, even if you start doing that right now, and at least for the next you know uh, four or five months, I think. So it sounds like that there's not a hard roadmap that says you know we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to do this, um, but more uh, an, um, uh, getting some base technologies in places that, that, that enable certain kinds of uh, approaches to developing uh, these apps. Um, so I mean, the closest thing to the roadmap, I think, is the state of the prototype the, 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 in terms of functionality, uh, uh, because that's the piece that is, I think, best understood at this point in terms of library-specific functionality, and we want to tackle that first uh, in terms of app building. Uh, so uh, I think it's the user management pieces. It's the um, 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 you know the, the sort of cross-cutting concerns like notifications and bookmarks and, and stuff like that. So everything that's you know uh, that's that's visible in the prototype, I, I it's probably constitutes the you know the the shorter uh, the, the short-term roadmap, or long, longer-term roadmap. Yeah. Right. I, I really just wanted to pick up on though uh, and emphasize the point that you made that um, this you know for lack of a better word, this roadmap will come into better resolution and vision as these conversations happen. So uh, developers should, who are interested in the APIs and in, in um, working on modules or understanding 
uh, what modules are being worked on should really be joining into those conversations uh, because that will help drive what um, the developers are thinking are important. Is that right? Precisely, yep. Great. Um, we have about uh, six minutes left. Uh, if anybody has any other questions. I'm just going to give a minute. Uh, while we see if any other questions come in, uh, I, I want to remind uh, attendees that we do these fully informed about every two weeks. Uh, our next one is on October 5th. Uh, it, the title of it is Integrating the Library into New Methods of Research by Jacob Jaskoff, who has been doing some um, broad uh, and diverse uh, conversations with the library community about where we're going and what are the important um, needs that libraries have going forward. Uh, so it would be a good place to come and see how we're thinking about folio developing over time uh, beyond the kinds of core uh, functionality that an integrated library system might have. Uh, so that'll be on October 5th at this same time. Uh, and with that, I'm not seeing any other questions come in, so I want to thank our, our panelists today. This has been uh, really informative uh, and encourage everyone to look forward to uh, our next forum. The recording will be made available later today um, and uh, available on the OLA website. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great to have everybody here. Thanks, thank everybody. You.